that we have these heavy planes with indices which don't make sense and they seem to vary quite a lot. You know? And not only that, but they are irrational. So why should we have a 3, 10, 15 heavy planes? The orientation relationships are not rational either. And I explained that the shape deformation we observe indicates that there is a coherent interface between the parent and product. And I'm now going to demonstrate that it is actually impossible to get a coherent interface between austenite and ferrite. Okay. Uh, so even this last statement is inconsistent with the crystallography. So everything is confusing at this stage. Okay. Okay. So here are the crystal structures of austenite and ferrite. Uh, ferrite is body-centered cubic. Um, austenite is face-centered cubic. I haven't drawn in all the face-centering atoms simply because it would look confusing. But you've got a cube, you've got atoms at the corner and um, atoms at the face centers. And these are the unit cells of ferrite and austenite. So let's see how we can change one crystal into the other by a deformation, homogeneous deformation. And this was actually considered by Bain many, many years ago, 1924. Okay. So let's imagine that this is the unit cell of austenite. So again, we've got atoms at the center of each face and atoms at the corner. I'm just going to put two of these unit cells next to each other. Okay. So we're not doing anything except just drawing two black unit cells next to each other. Right? Now, the unit cell is imaginary. You know, it doesn't actually exist. There are no lines between atoms joining them up. Yeah? So we can actually draw a unit cell in many different ways to represent the same pattern of atoms. So for example, if I've got atoms here, I mean, just by intuition, it would seem logical to draw that as a unit cell because the angles are 90 degrees, the lengths are all equal lots of symmetry, yeah? but I could equally well draw a unit cell which looks like this. The only requirement for a unit cell is that I can stack them up to produce the pattern in three dimensions. Yeah? So there's nothing wrong, I haven't done a change in crystal structure, this represents the same crystal structure as this, it's just a different drawing. Similarly, when I put these two black cubic unit cells next to each other, I can equally well represent the arrangement of atoms by this red colored cell, which is not cubic, but which is body-centered tetragonal. You can see that this axis here is different from these two axes, and we've got a body-centering atom there. Yeah. So it's exactly the same pattern of atoms of austenite, but I'm representing it as a different kind of a unit cell, a body-centered tetragonal cell. And if I remove that red cell, it looks like this. Okay, so this is still austenite. We haven't done anything to the austenite. But you can now see the sort of deformation that would change it into ferrite. Yeah. If I simply compress along this axis and uniformly expand along these two axes, then I end up with the structure of ferrite. Okay. So even though austenite and ferrite look, whoops, look very different on this picture, you know, here we have a body centering atom, here we only have face centering atoms, they are actually very similar. Yes. And Bain saw this, and therefore we call this the Bain strain, a homogeneous deformation in which we compress along this axis and we expand along these two axes. Yes. Now there are other ways in which I can deform austenite into ferrite, but a great deal of work has shown that this kind of a deformation would lead to the smallest strain. So we're going to stick with this, okay? But one thing I want you to notice is that this predicts the orientation relationship between austenite and ferrite. Because look, this edge of austenite will be parallel to this edge of austenite. So I could write down that 0, 0, 001 of austenite is parallel to 0, 0, 001 of ferrite. Okay. So the vertical edges are parallel. Similarly, you see this direction here is parallel to this direction of austenite. So I could write uh, 0, 1, 0. Oh, sorry. 0, 1, 0 of ferrite is parallel to a 1, 1, 0 of austenite. So 
So it seems as if we predicted the orientation relationship, but of course this is not what we observe experimentally. Yeah. So even though Bain has identified the best deformation which will convert austenite into ferrite, it's predicting the wrong orientation relationship. Okay. So, uh, you know, we, we don't have those directions parallel when we measure the orientation. It's roughly the closed back planes being parallel and roughly the closed back directions being parallel. So there's something missing from this. So this is yet a fourth inconsistency we have. So I'm going to represent this deformation slightly differently now. Uh, I'm going to choose the austenite as a sphere. Right. Now if I do the Bain strain to the sphere, it changes into an ellipsoid because I compress along this axis and uniformly expand along these two axes. So that's represented, okay, this is just a, a matrix representation of that deformation, where these are the principal distortions, okay? Uh, I'm not going to go into this further, you can download a book from my website describing calculations like these, uh, but what I want you to understand is that all of this can be represented using 3x3 three three matrices and vectors, so that the process of calculation becomes very, very easy. Okay, so. The yellow part here is the sphere of austenite, okay? and I'm plotting here the, the vertical axis of the unit cell, the 0, 0, 1 direction, and one of the horizontal axis. So obviously when I compress along here and expand along here and in this direction, I end up with an ellipse of revolution about the vertical axis, right? Now notice that there are these two vectors here, OA and OB, which, as a consequence of the vein strain, don't change in length. Right? You can see that they're still all radii of this circle. Are those vectors, are they invariant lines? That's what you mean by invariant. Um, yeah. the, the, the magnitude will be the same, but the orientation obviously will be, be different. Exactly right. So that's not invariant. Yeah, because to be an uh, invariant line, it must be undistorted and unrotated. So if you look at that diagram, there's absolutely no line there which is invariant to the Bain scale. So we can't satisfy the <coughs> fundamental condition we came up with this morning that the deformation which carries austenite into ferrite must leave one line incoherent. Uh, coherent, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So we, we are getting even more confused now. <laughs> you know, the, the deformation which converts the lattices is not only inconsistent with the shape deformation which is an invariant plane straight, but it doesn't even leave a single line. Okay. However, here is the first solution to the problem. If I add a rigid body rotation to this, if I take the sphere and I rotate it by this angle theta, one of those lines becomes completely invariant. Okay? So the Bain strain and a rigid body rotation gives us an invariant line strain. And it turns out that the amount of rigid body rotation that we need to add to make that line invariant is exactly predicts the orientation relationship that you observe experimentally, the irrational orientation relationship. So this rotation to the ferrite, which makes the deformation into an invariant line strain, exactly predicts the or observed orientation relationship. So now you have a method of precisely predicting the orientation between the austenite and myelin site. Of course, there is no way I can produce two invariant lines. Yeah. Whatever rotation I choose, you won't get both those lines to come into coincidence. So it's still inconsistent with the observed shape deformation, which is an invariant plane strain. Yeah. But we've explained completely the orientation relationship. For any Martin Cedric transformation using this simple method, you can exactly predict the orientation relation. Is everybody happy with that? Okay, so let's go on to, um, okay, this is a summary. 
So the orientation relationship is solved, and that applies to any Martin Zedek transformation. But the shape deformation is inconsistent with this, okay? because this is only an invariant line strain, whereas what we observe macroscopically is like a shear on a plane which is unchanged. So we haven't answered that inconsistency, and we haven't explained the fact that the habit planes are strange. Okay, so I'm going to try and explain that now. And this is the very famous theory, which was produced in Australia by Bowles and Mackenzie back in 1953. The paper is dated 1954 because, as I said this morning, it was rejected until the Americans independently invented uh, the theory. Yes, but it's universally recognized that the orig originators were Bowles and Mackenzie. So the paper was published in 1954, after whoever refereed it admitted that it was correct. Okay, so I'm going to start now, instead of using a sphere, I'm going to start with an austenite crystal of this shape, okay. just because it makes life easier. And to summarize the inconsistencies using pictures. So I'm starting with an austenite crystal of this shape. When I transform it to martensite, I observe that the deformation is like a shear, okay. so it changes into a square. But of course, an invariant plane strain cannot produce ferrite. We've demonstrated that the deformation which takes austenite into ferrite is an invariant line strain. Therefore, if I apply the observed shape change to the austenite, I produced the wrong crystal structure. Because you cannot have a shear deformation changing austenite into martensite. So the observed shape change is inconsistent with the deformation which takes austenite into ferrite. And we'll call this shape deformation the matrix P1. In order to produce the right structure, the total deformation here must be an invariant line strain. Now, supposing I have an invariant plane strain on this plane and another invariant plane strain on this plane, what is that total deformation? So I'm operating two different shears. What is the net result? Is it? Sorry? Uh, sorry, what? No, I mean, they're on different planes. Different planes. So one shear is happening on this plane, one shear on this plane. Is there any line which is left unchanged by the combination of the one x is a symmetry. The common No, you see the shear will leave every line in this plane unchanged. This shear will leave every line in this plane. So at the intersection there'll be a line which is completely undistorted and unrotated by both deformations. Okay. So a combination of two invariant plane strains, say P one and P two Oops, that is. Um, it seems to shut down the yeah. screen side. Maybe. Uh, I haven't got the screen saver on. Okay. This happened. No, no. This no, happened. Uh, this happened uh, a while ago. So it, it's okay. We'll recover from it. The the power seems to have gone off. Yeah, that's why I wanted to Yeah, because my my computer uh, is on battery. No, my, my computer is on battery, so yeah, I think, uh, power's gone up. Yeah. Or did I step on the? Oh, I don't know. You seem to have come yeah. the wall. Just like, so yeah. that's, uh, power's off. Uh, my computer is running on battery. Yeah. Let's oh, it started again, so the power's come on again. <laughs> anyway, you know, these are the things that make lectures exciting. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So, um, when we combine two shears, we are left with a line which is completely unaffected. <coughs> so, P1 and P2 does, in fact, give us an invariant line strain. Okay. So, the missing deformation is 
that if I add another shear on a different plane, yeah, this one was we sheared yeah. here, and now we shear on this plane, then I get the correct crystal structure, which is Martin's act. But of course, I don't observe the macroscopic shape deformation, which corresponds to two shears. I only observe one shear. So this is basically just a summary of the problem that needed to be solved for many, many decades. Okay? That if I transform austenite to martensite using the observed shape change, I get the wrong crystal structure. If I add another shear to get the right crystal structure, then the macroscopic deformation that we observe is inconsistent with the combined P1 and P2. Okay? Now, do you know of any deformations which don't change the crystal structure? Twinning. Yeah, dilatation, twinning, yeah. twinning. Anything else? Yeah. When the metal doesn't twin, what's the left? Slip. Yeah. yeah. So supposing I could add an, a deformation which corrects that last shape but doesn't change the crystal structure, then we have a solution. So here we are. Supposing I periodically twin this crystal so that its macroscopic shape is the same as this, but the crystal structure is correct, then the problem is solved. Okay. So we, are, we are adding a deformation which is called a lattice invariant deformation because it doesn't change the crystal structure. But it corrects the macroscopic shape. So what this predicts is that we should see twins inside mountain size. Okay, so this is a prediction. Furthermore, it explains the strange habit planes that we see. Because look, even if these planes are rational planes, the average plane here is not. Okay. Depends on how much twinning we put into the system. Okay. Similarly, I could accomplish this using slip. Okay. So I could deform this heterogeneously until its macroscopic shape is that. Again, these facets on here are rational planes, but this could be anything, depending on how much deformation I need to add. And then the complete problem is solved. And the reason why we want the macroscopic shape to be like this, instead of like this, is that this greatly reduces the strain energy compared with an invariant line strain. So macroscopically, it's behaving like a shear deformation. Microscopically, it's actually an invariant line strain. If you look closely enough using electron microscopy, you will either see these slip steps or you will see twins. And this was predicted well before things were observed by Bowles and Mackenzie. So everything is solved. And let me show you, uh, you know, now I'm putting the, that picture in the context of a plate shape that we see. So here you are. You've got the slip steps and this is your mighty side plate and similarly twins side plate, and when electron microscopy became common, yeah. uh, of course, the twins were observed. So this is our plate of mountain side, and you can see, you know, twins which are placed at about 200 angstroms from each other. Absolutely beautiful image, yeah. predicted by theory and observed experimentally, and the complete problem is solved now. We've explained the orientation relationship the habit plane, if you combine all those matrices together, you can exactly predict the crystallography of mind inside, the shear deformation, everything. Every crystallographic aspect of mind inside is predicted. If I just go back, okay, I'll go forward, in fact. There is another mountain silic transformation which happens in steels, and that's when austenite goes to hexagonal iron instead of polycentric cubic iron. So that's called uh, epsilon margin side. So this is uh, austenite, and this is hexagonal iron. Now, you can think of the crystal structure of austenite as a stack of closed back planes in a sequence ABC, 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 repeating forever. Yeah. We take these closed back layers of atoms and you stack them on, that gives you the structure of austenite. But the stacking sequence in this direction is ABC. Hexagonal line is exactly the same, except the sequence is A, B, C, A, B, C, A, uh, no, sorry, A, B, A, B, A, B. 
So to change this to this, I simply need to shear along here to change that B layer to an A layer. So this is a much, much simpler Martin Siddick transformation, where if I go back, uh, when I go from here to here, I get the correct structure and the correct deformation, observed deformation, because you only need a single shear to change austenite into hexagonal closed back iron. So you will get a heavy plane which is exactly 111 austenite, okay. the plane on which the shear happens. Uh, there will be no twins and no steps in the interface. And that, again, is exactly what we observe. The orientation relationship will be exactly that the closed back planes are perfectly parallel and closed back directions within those planes are perfectly parallel. So in this case, we stop over here because the strain which transforms austenite into hexagonal iron is a shear deformation. It's not a more complicated deformation like an invariant line strain. So why don't we get more of epsilon problems that happen? Yeah. So it would be energetically more favorable. It's completely to do with its energy. So if I plot the phase diagram for pure iron pressure versus temperature, okay, uh, and the solid state only, then it looks uh, something like this. Where this is alpha, this is gamma. Oops, temperature versus pressure. Sorry, it's pressure. And this is epsilon. And this point here is about 130,000 atmospheres. And in pure iron, in pure iron. If you add lots of manganese, we can get epsilon iron and uh, ambient pressure. And certainly you find epsilon martensite here. And some of the iron-based shared memory alloys uh, have the manganese and silicon, which promotes epsilon martensite rather than uh, the body-centered cubic martensite. Everybody happy with this? So, in the case of the austenite to hexagonal flows packed uh, transformation, the Bain strain is, in fact, a shear. And therefore, the habit plane is exactly 111 austenite. And every single Martin Siddick transformation, whatever material, is perfectly explained by this theory. Uh, this is a, a transmission electron micrograph of an austenitic stainless steel with a stacking port. So, you know, instead of the ABC, ABC stacking, there's a mistake. And you have a three-layer rich, uh, three-layer deep region with AB, AB stacking. So, you could imagine that this is actually epsilon martensite. Okay? But, you know, this fear model that we use of atoms <coughs> isn't quite correct because the volume of the hexagonal closed back to iron is less than that of the austenite. HCP iron is actually denser than austenite. And you can't predict really <coughs> that from a hard sphere model. So, in fact, what you should be able to do is not just pick up this shear deformation, but also the volume change. And these guys in 1979 did a beautiful experiment to show that there is also a volume change. So this is a fault in the stacking sequence. If you image the fault using a diffraction vector, which is at 90 degrees to the displacement, then it should become invisible. And indeed, it does, but not completely invisible. You can see some contrast here. And that is because of the volume change. So this truly is a three-layer rich, uh, three-layer deep region of hexagonal iron, no, Martin site. Okay, now we go on to uh, change the topic because really everything about the crystallography is understood. <coughs> um, I mean that's a, a slight exaggeration, but really the essence of the problem is understood. Uh, we go on to thermodynamics because. We can predict the crystallography, we can predict the size of plates, etc., because we have the strain energy equation and so on. But we need to predict the temperature at which the transformation can happen. Yeah? What controls the low, uh, highest temperature at which mountain side can form? Okay, so uh, we're plotting here an iron carbon alloy, and we've got carbon concentration along here, 
and this is the Gibbs free energy being plotted here. And the free energy curve for ferrite varies with carbon concentration like this, and that for austenite varies as follows. And in order to calculate an equilibrium phase diagram, you take those two surfaces and you draw a common tangent to them. Okay? And that gives you the equilibrium composition of austenite and ferrite because that gives you the minimum free energy state. So the equilibrium composition of ferrite will be this, and the equilibrium composition of austenite will be this. If I plot the locus of those points as a function of temperature, I generate my phase diagram. You know, the iron carbon phase diagram that I drew earlier, where we have temperature versus carbon, and look something like this. It's this line and this line that I'm plotting on this phase diagram. So that's how we calculate an equilibrium phase diagram. But of course, martensite is not an equilibrium transformation. You know, it's diffusionless. Carbon doesn't want to be in there. Uh, it's trapped by the movement of the interface. Now, there is a point here which is not plotted on equilibrium phase diagrams, where the free energy of austenite and of ferrite is exactly the same for the same composition. So they have the same chemical composition and the same free energy. Okay. And we call that the T0 point. And if I extrapolate that point onto this diagram, where we are plotting temperature, then I get a curve which is not on the phase diagram. It's called the T0 curve. And the importance of this curve is that if austenite is of this composition, that means richer than this point in carbon, then it's impossible for you to transform without diffusion, because that will lead to an increase in free energy. On the other hand, on this side, even if I don't change chemical composition, I have a decrease in free energy. So this defines the limit beyond which it is thermodynamically <coughs> impossible to get martensitic transformation. You know, if I have austenite of this composition, it simply cannot transform by a diffusionless mechanism. Okay, so this curve is really quite important and sets the thermodynamic limit to diffusionless transformation. Okay. Now, of course, uh, if that was the only element of the story, then I would just read off this as my martin size type temperature. And similarly, if I had an alloy of this composition, I would read this off as my martin size type temperature. But there are other terms that come into the thermodynamics. Okay, this is just another illustration of the T0 condition that if I'm on this side, I can transform to martin side. But if I have austenite of this composition, it would lead to an increase in free energy, so it's not possible. We need to add strain energy to our calculation. You see, those free energy curves are for equilibrium. That means there's no strain. So what I need to do is to raise the free energy curve of the ferrite by the strain energy that we calculate from the equation I gave you this morning, which is that the strain energy per unit volume is equal to C over R, the thickness to the length ratio of the plate, times the shear modulus, times the shear strain squared, plus the dilatation strain squared. Okay. And that comes to approximately 700 joules per mole here. So we can work that out from the crystallography, how much shear we expect and how much dilatation we expect. So the strain energy is about 600 joules per mole. We have created twin interfaces inside the plate because of that lattice invariant deformation that I talked about. <coughs> and there is a cost to those interfaces. And that comes to about 100 joules per mole. And then we have uh, the interface, overall interface energy with the austenite, which is quite a small number because the plate is large, so the surface to volume ratio is small. Very frequently, uh, the very large deformation accompanying martensite can't be elastically accommodated, so we create dislocations, debris, yeah, defects, and that comes to around 20 joules per mole. We add all that up, Okay, this is just to show you the shape deformation, but it's not important. Okay, so we add all that up, and the condition for martensitic transformation becomes that 
that the chemical free energy change, delta G gamma to alpha, must be greater than or equal to the stored energy due to the shape change, which is 600 joules per mole, plus the 100 joules per mole due to twins, plus the uh, 20 joules per mole due to defects, and the interface energy. When we do that balance, we can predict the mountain side start temperature. So we've solved everything about mountain side now. You can go away and do calculations in principle. Any questions? Really, is one of the most beautiful theories. You know. So this is, in fact, how you use empty data in thermal calc and so on to calculate the Martin side start temperature. <coughs> even though those programs are designed for equilibrium phase diagram calculations. Um, mountain side um, needs a time factor. Um, uh, let's, let's look at it from a practical point of view. We've got a piece of uh, steel, we optimize it, we quench it. Um, depending on the quenching side, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to reconcile this theory with the fact, I mean, a lot of it makes sense with it when, when you talk about the diffusionless, the yeah. parameters for diffusionless stuff. But we know for a fact that it's the conditions are not right, you, you, you do get the theory. Now, can the theory predict how that diffusion will, will, will take place? Right, that's a very, very good question. Okay. So, I'm just going to sketch a time temperature transformation diagram. Okay. Uh, this is the Martin side start temperature, and we've got other transformations happening. So you really need to know how fast to cool. Now, these transformations are the subject of the next lectures. Yeah? But the theory I presented today only deals with mountain side. So it's incomplete as far as the calculation of a real mountain structure is concerned. But I'm going to cover all the other transformations in the next set of lectures. And then we have a complete model. And I'll can give you a case study. Yeah, can you also just shift a bit more light on uh, the really important factor is the carbon diff diffusion from the Osterline, yeah. um, if you're calling right, it's not right. So again, the, 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 the driving force is that that need to be in, a, in equilibrium? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know what I mean, yes, I know exactly what you mean. Um, see, according to this, the solubility of carbon in ferrite is far, far smaller than in austenite, you know, okay. orders of magnitude smaller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the carbon doesn't want to be in the ferrite. Okay. Now, in the case of martensite, mm -hmm. it's forced to be there because the kinetics does not actually allow it to partition. Yes. And that's why we get these other reactions, okay. yeah, which I will come uh, come to, and we will develop a theory for diffusion control group. Okay. Shape of, I just wondering what, what the shape of this crystal structure is. Yep. Yeah. Let me pull that slide back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this here is is a macroscopic crystal. It doesn't represent the crystal structure. It's a particular shape I've chosen simply to illustrate the deformations. But it could be any any shape on this diagram. You know, uh, it's it's hiding the crystal structure in there. Uh, but in order to illustrate the shears, I've chosen it to be of that shape. So this is no reflection of its crystalline symmetry. Yeah. Tomorrow's lecture will be on Bay Night. Okay. So, uh, just you know, uh, 
How do you define in the reverse modern city transformation? Yeah. <laughs> so it's exactly exactly okay. the same. Yeah. So you know you can use the same theory to start with body center cubic and go to face center cubic and in copper alloys, yeah, you actually go from body center cubic to face center cubic. But in principle there's absolutely no no difference in the theory. And it even applies to really complicated things like, you know, plutonium actually melts at six hundred degrees centigrade and the solids that form are less dense than the liquid. So they're very unstable and they undergo a whole series of mind density transformations. But the crystal structures are incredibly complicated. But the same theory applies. Similarly, uranium alloys, some of the ceramics are complicated. But in principle, they all are explained by this theory. You've shown that you can show that you calculate the mass at start temperature. Can you also calculate mass at finish temperature? Okay, uh, that's a very good question, and I haven't explained one of the equations that I presented in the morning. Okay, thermal rate. So, let me first of all just uh, explain this equation. So this is the volume fraction of Martensite you produce as a function of undercooling below the Martensite start temperature. And you have to define a Martensite finish temperature as, say, only 5% of the parent phase is left, say. Yeah. So if you set that as 95, then you effectively get a Martensite finish temperature. But the origin of this equation uh, is based on nucleation theory that when I'm at a certain undercooling, I've got a certain number of defects which are active. I have to go to a higher undercooling to activate further, less effective defects, and so on. And that's the reason why we increase the fraction as we go down in temperature, but not at constant temperature. What would Lath and um, the other... Uh, Lath and plate. Yeah. yeah. That's the difference in carbon content. And is there also a difference in slip versus spinning in those? Yeah. Actually, you know, that is an incredibly difficult question because the reason for the change from the plate to a large shape is because plasticity comes into it. You know, the large mountain size form at a relatively high temperature where the austenite itself is weak. Mm -hmm. So when you get these really huge deformations, you get lots of plasticity in the austenite. Okay. Uh, and that is the cause of the transition in shape that when you form at high temperatures, the austenite is simply not strong enough mm -hmm. to support very large shear strains. But the theory for that is, is really complicated, you know, because it involves plasticity. Right. So can your model also uh, predict that is training used you know, to the modern city? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, you know, I said in the morning that you can treat this exactly Okay, you can treat this exactly like a, a deformation. And you know, when you describe a deformation mode, Give you a lot of talks if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lecture I gave in India, Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So when we talk about slip, we have a slip system. That means it happens on a particular plane and in a particular direction. For example, in austenite, the slip system is that slip happens on the 111 planes and in the 10 bar 1 directions, right? Now, if we forget about the fact that mountainside produces a crystal structure change, 
Okay, and the further thing you're defining is the Burgers vector here is a by 2, 1, 0, bar 1. Okay, so that's the magnitude of the displacement. In modern science, if you forget about the crystal structure change, it happens on a particular plane. Okay, you have a plane. Uh, the shear is in a particular direction and it has a magnitude. So it's exactly like information and if you apply a stress, say, along this direction and this is your plate of margin set, then you can resolve a normal component of the stress and a shear component of the stress in the direction of the shear. And you can predict which variant, which crystal, which, just like you can predict which slip system is going to operate here, you can predict which variant is going to form. So it's a physical deformation, but it involves a change in crystal structure. But on that same similar subject, mm -hmm. the stress induced by the side decomposition, mm -hmm. then I can I can understand uh, having a, a slip which will go the other the, the other way. Yeah. But then you could account for the carbon, and the carbon must somehow diffuse out. If you are at a temperature where that's not possible, then it doesn't have to diffuse out. Now, carbon is very mobile, mm -hmm. yeah? but if you form under conditions where it can't diffuse within the time scale of the experiment, then it gets trapped. Yeah? So what would the microstructure be? A, a ferrite rich in... Yeah, supersaturated with carbon, mm -hmm. exactly right. Okay. Um, carbon is really be, unhappy there. So yeah. it would be very, very stable. No, I mean, if you temper it, then it, just it precipitates mm -hmm. or goes into the osmite. Yeah. yeah, so it's not a stable microstructure. Okay, tomorrow, uh, on uh, Monday. Yeah. Um, so we should thank you. Yeah. <laughs>